Okay. So thank you for joining the Bible study. Um, we're going to continue from what we've learned last week. Um, we were learning about how to prepare for the end times. So that'll just be the title again. Okay, so last time we learned that we are currently living in the era of the beast. Um, I hope that everybody was able to either listen to last week's Bible study through uh, either Zoom or on YouTube. It's up on our uh, church's YouTube channel if you missed it. Um, and the, when I say the era of the beast, that, that's the era uh, where the the beastly worldview reigns, right? And when I say beastly worldview, it sounds like something terrible, and it is, but it's not like what we might be thinking, right? So what, is, what, am I, what do I mean by that? Uh, a, a human being in the image of God has three parts, right? We have a spirit, we have soul, and we have body, right? But a beast or animals only have soul and body. Now, according to Psalm 49 verse 20, even human beings who don't have God's word, who do not believe in God, are like beasts. Because when you don't believe in God, when you do not accept Jesus Christ, uh, and you deny the existence of God, your spirit dies. So that means if you don't, you're, if your spirit is dead, then that person is basically the same as an as a beast, right? There is really nothing that distinguishes them to be a human being. That's the biblical definition. So from that, we could go forward and say a beastly worldview is a worldview that denies God and it denies the existence of a spiritual world. Okay. And it's entirely materialistic. That means only things you see and you touch, only matter exists. The people who believe in this beastly world, you say there's no spiritual world you know, there's no soul or whatever, but only matter, only material things exist, okay? And this kind of worldview basically started in the 18th century with the Enlightenment, okay? And it has been going on ever since. So right now, we are living in that era where this beastly worldview reigns, okay? So everywhere you go, this is, the whole world is being ruled over by this kind of worldview, okay? So, um, even us, this is why we have to be careful. All of us have been born into this kind of a worldview, right? We grew up in it. We went to school in it. And even when you go to school, our teachers are, have lived and their mindsets has been trained in it. So that's all we've been learning ever since we were born. Okay. And then those of us now who have come to church, who've received the word. Now we are learning that what this really is. Now we're learning what God wants for us to believe in. But for all of us, we have been living in that kind of a, a worldview. So, that's still in us. And sometimes it just comes out, right? And it's still in our minds. That's why we have to be careful. Okay? That's why we need to really uh, just fill ourselves with God's word so that our worldview and our thoughts and our beliefs can change, right? And then we learned that after that, you know, in the 20th century, there's been wars and famines and plagues continuing on and on. Even today, we have a pandemic, right? So these are all signs that we are approaching the end times. But Jesus told us, when you see all these things happening, that's not the end yet, but those are just the birth pangs. 
Okay, that's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through 8. What are birth pangs? Well, you know, when a woman is about to give birth to a baby, she has, you know, pains. She has pain. Like she goes into labor, right? So from the time that a woman becomes pregnant, how, how many days exactly until the birth of the child? Well, you can't be exactly sure, right? You can't say exactly this many days, right? But how do you know? The woman knows through the pain she feels, right? So that's the, the analogy that Jesus used. So how do we know that the end is getting near? These kinds of signs get faster and they get, they intensify, right? Like birth pains, they get stronger and the, the, the interval between them gets shorter and shorter. And it's the same thing in the end. Wars, famines, plagues, earthquakes, all these kinds of things, they keep happening, but they get more intense, they get stronger, and they happen in shorter intervals. They happen more often, right? Then you know that you're really getting to the, 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 close to the end times, right? So we learned uh, last week the first through the fourth seals, okay? Those are like the wars, famines, and plagues, right? And then the beastly worldview. Now the fifth seal is in... Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Let's just briefly read that. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. So when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to, who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So this is the fifth seal. The fifth seal are the martyrs. So now, I have to tell you this. These seals don't go in chronological order. So you, sometimes they go back and forth like this, right? So what is this fifth seal talking about? These, are all, these martyrs are all martyrs. The saints of the Old Testament times, they have died for their faith. And they have been waiting to be vindicated and justified, waiting at the altar in heaven. And then they said, how long, O Lord? And that's the point when God says, okay, come out. I'm going to give you these white rows, but wait a little longer until the number of uh, uh, the fullness of the martyrs are filled. Then it'll be complete. Okay. So when did this happen? This happened at the cross of Jesus Christ. What happened at the cross? The martyrs were vindicated. In other words, they received their white robes. What does that mean? So white robe signifies, you know, righteousness. So they were justified. They were vindicated. The white robes means that they were vindicated. What were they vindicated for? For their faith. Remember, they died for their faith, right? And what was their faith? These Old Testament saints, their faith was they believed in the promise of the coming of the Messiah. And they died for that faith. Now, when Jesus came and died on the cross and resurrected, their faith was vindicated. They're, now they could say, look, what we believed in was true. It happened. It was fulfilled. That's the moment where they received their white robes. And then God says, now here's your white robes, wait in heaven until the fullness of the martyrs, uh, the, that number is filled, then the end will come, right? So what, um, the second thing that this seal teaches us is that persecutions and tribulations will continue until the end. Okay, so that's why God is telling them to wait until the fullness of the martyrs come. And then the sixth seal is Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. Okay. And what is the sixth seal? Well, let's just read that verse real quick. So from verse 12, he broke the sixth seal. There was an earthquake. The sun became dark. The moon became like blood. Stars fell from the, earth, uh, from the sky to the earth. Uh, and then the sky was split apart. And then the kings and the great men of the earth all hid because... They were afraid of the wrath of the Lamb. Okay, that's the sixth seal. 
So basically, there are a couple of things, a couple of major things going on here. First is earthquake. So what's what's an earthquake spiritually? In the Bible, there's so many prophecies about earthquakes. And there have been a lot of earthquakes in the 20th century. But this is not just, it's this, you have to read this on two levels. The physical, actual earthquakes, but also spiritual earthquakes. So, you know, example is Joel chapter 2 verse 10 says there will be earthquakes. Matthew chapter 24 verse 29 says there will be earthquakes. Um, and Hebrews chapter 12 verses 26 through 27 talks about spiritual earthquakes. So what are earthquakes? Earthquakes is the shaking of things that people thought were stable. Okay? The earth is what we step on, what we live on, right? So the earth is something that everybody thinks is just a stable, solid ground. But when those things start to shake, people get scared, right? I don't know how many of you have actually experienced earthquakes. I've experienced a lot of earthquakes in California, and sometimes they're really scary. But the spiritual earthquake is, is even more scary, where things are shaky, things are uncertain. So there's strife and riots and rebellions, disruption of order and chaos. Those things are all earthquakes. But one important thing is that spiritual earthquake, truth will be shaken. The concept of truth will be shaken. Okay, this should really like, hit you in the mind right now because we're living in, in this era right now. When did truth get shaken? Uh, have, you, have you heard of something called post-modernity, post-modernism? So there's the modern era and then there's the post-modern era. It just means after modernity, right? But post one of the characteristics of post-modernity is relativism. What's relativism? Relativism means everything is relative. There is no absolute truth. It is the denial of absolute truth. That's the major earthquake that is going on right now. There is no truth. What you believe in is truth for you. What I believe in is truth for me. What that guy believes in is truth for him. What that, what that woman believes in is truth for her. Everybody has their own truth. There's no absolute truth. That's what postmodern people say. And we're, we're living in that era right now. So there's an earthquake going on spiritually. There is no solid ground. Everything's always moving. Okay? Because there's no truth. But we believe in an absolute truth, right? God's word is the absolute truth. That's our solid footing. We have to build our house on that right? On the word of God. So let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Matthew seven twenty four says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. See, everybody who hears Jesus's words and he lives according to them, he or she lives according to them, that person has built their house on a solid rock. And nothing will shake that. Okay? But out there in the world who don't have the word of God, their world is constantly being shaken right now. Okay? Because they don't have a truth you know, to stand on. Okay? So that's earthquake. Number two, the sun will be darkened. Okay? So in the Bible, obviously the sun symbolizes god right so in psalm 84 verse 11 it says that god is the sun and also you know jesus is the sun right and his word is the sun so when it says that the sun will be darkened it, it's talking about the glorious light of heaven will be darkened okay Rebellious human beings will try to block out the sun, okay? And they will tell people, hey, you don't need that. Okay? They're going to try to darken the sun. You know, sometimes that can happen, right? 
you could block the sun with your hand like this and you think that you're blocking it, but you're really not, right? That's how people are fooling themselves. So we're going to talk more about how the devil is darkening the sun right now. Okay. But all of these things, all of the seals, the trumpets and the plagues, the, all of these things in Revelation are a judgment upon the rebellion of modern humankind, of this modern world. It's God's judgment upon the modern world. But we must stand on our ancient faith. Let's look at Jeremiah 6.16. So Jeremiah 6.16 6, says, Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. See? The good path is the ancient path. And what is the ancient path? That's the path that's in the Bible that is set out for us in the word of God. But modern people are saying, no, we don't want to walk in that, right? That's what's going on right now. So we must not take after those kinds of people, right? So how does this modern, fallen, corrupt world do all these things? Okay, how do they do that? We need to know this because we're living in that era right now, right? We're living in the era of the beast. So the point is this, how can we not receive the mark of the beast? which is 666, right? How can we not receive this, but receive the seal of God on our foreheads so that we could stand on Mount Zion with the rest of the 144,000? That's the point, right? That's the key right here. That's what we're trying to do. And in order to do this, our first step to doing this is to expose the works of the devil so that we're not deceived by his lies, okay? So, in order to expose the works of the devil, we're going to be learning about the three woes. That's in Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. So, Revelation chapter 8, verse 13 says, Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So this eagle is flying through the sky and he said, Woe, woe, woe. Three woes, right? So there, it's saying that there will be three woes from now on. What are these three woes? Well, first of all, the three woes are the first woe equals the fifth trumpet remember there's seven trumpets right so just just for those of us who may not be familiar with the book of revelation there's the seven seals there's seven trumpets and then there's seven bowls of wrath they're all very connected they're connected they're not seals trumpets bowls like this they're not in order like that they're all connected so they're all going Sometimes parallel, sometimes sequentially like this, right? So it's kind of confusing, but just know that, okay? The, the, and then there are three woes here. The first woe is the fifth trumpet. Second woe is the sixth trumpet. And then the third woe is the seventh trumpet. But the seventh trumpet turns into the seven bowls. So the third woe are all of the seven bowls, okay? It's a little bit confusing. Just know that, and we'll talk about that some other time, okay? But today, we're going to get into the, the woes. The first woe, we'll probably only talk about the first woe today. The first woe is the locusts. That's in Revelation 9, 1 through 12. The second woe is the war on river Euphrates. And that's sometimes known as Armageddon. And then the third woe, as I said before, are the seven bulls of wrath. Okay, so uh, 
let me just show you one verse. Revelation chapter 9, verse 12, right here. The first woe is past, right? Behold, two woes are still coming after these. So Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 11 were the first woe. That was the first woe. Okay? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. The first woe. So let's look at that. Let's look at Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given, given them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Okay, so that's the fifth trumpet, which is the first woe. Let me explain what this is. Because if we understand this, then we will understand how the devil is trying to darken the sun and deceive us from not believing in God and leaving Jesus. Okay, so we need to know this. So in this first woe, what happens was uh, the star from heaven fell. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke came out. Okay, smoke from the bottomless pit. Okay, and then what did the smoke do? It darkened the sun and the air. Okay, so what is this smoke from the bottomless pit? If you look in the History of Redemption series books, especially book five, the three major sins of Babylon, basically, I think, remember in Revelation, the fallen world is called Babylon, right? In Revelation chapter 18. So the three major sins of Babylon are basically the three major sins of the world. And what are they? Idolatry, pride, and sexual immorality. Okay? So basically, all the sins of this world can be categorized into these three broad categories. Now here, smoke is pride. Why? Because smoke goes up, right? Like this, like human pride. So the star that fell from heaven, Again, in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 13, it talks about the morning star that fell. And, you know, that morning star is known as Lucifer, who according to Christian, you know, I guess legend or what have you, became Satan, right? Well, a, a star fell from heaven. What did that star do? Open the bottomless pit and let the smoke out. He let human pride out. And it's basically human pride that made us rebel against God. This morning star that fell, what was its objective? To be equal with God. And that's basically the objective of human pride as well. To be equal with God. To be God. That's the objective of human pride. So that smoke comes up and it darkens the sun and the air. Okay? So, like smoke, when it goes up, it darkens, it, makes a, it forms a cloud and it darkens the sun, right? Like that, human pride will prevent the word of God from coming into our hearts. It will block our ears from hearing God's word. And then it also darkened the air, right? Pride will prevent you from praying. Because why is air prayer? Because prayer is spiritual breathing. So if we don't pray, we're going to die spiritually. Our spirits will die. So we need to pray. Praying is our spiritual breathing. That's why God said, pray at all times. Pray constantly. Just like breathing. Okay. So human pride prevents the sun, the word of God from coming to us. And it prevents us from praying. Okay. 
it darkens the air, right? When smoke comes up, you can't breathe, right? You cough, you can't breathe, right? That's how uh, this is going to happen. Now, but more specifically, how does the devil do this? Our senior pastor said, through flattery and lies. And when I first heard this, I was like, what? How? Flattery and lies, how does that prevent us from getting the word and not praying? Okay. Flattery and lies. So some verses, Job 32, 22, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 5, Proverbs 26, 28. This all talks about flattery. In Hebrew, the word flattery means to give special honor. But when it's used in a negative sense, to give false honor. That's flattery. To give, flattery is like giving false honors to someone who doesn't deserve it. And what's the purpose of flattery? To get that person to like you or to do something for you. Whatever. You're trying to use that person by flattering them, right? So giving false honor. Okay? And that's a lie, right? This is what the devil uses to trick mankind. It lets out the human pride. And that basically cuts us off from the word of God and from prayer. So as a, as a specific example, uh, let's look at how the serpent did this to Adam. To Adam and Eve. See, the serpent used flattery, right? And lies. Basically, the serpent said, you don't need God. You're good enough. See, God doesn't want you to eat from that tree because he doesn't want you to be just like him. See, that's flattery, right? And that's a lie. And Adam fell for it. And that's why he fell and he was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, right? And the devil is doing the same thing in modern times. What happened? Well, basically, he said to human beings, look how smart you guys are. You guys made all these things. You don't need God. All you need is reason. All you need is your intellect. And you could live without God. You could get salvation without God. You could make utopia without God. You just need to work together. Use your brain because you guys have a great brain. And human beings fell for that, you know, in the 18th century. And that's what's going on right now, even today. That's how the devil tricked human beings from leaving God. And that pride, when it comes out, it darkens the sun and the air. So a proud person leaves God and they don't pray because they're all they need. When you're so proud, you're, you yourself, you're the only one that's needed, right? So the devil lied to human beings and flattered them and tricked them into thinking that I'm God. I don't need anyone else above me. I could make utopia with my own strength. Okay. Basically, that's the smoke, right? Basically, do, I mean, we have some young people here. Basically, the devil blew smoke up our butts, and we fell for it, okay? All right, so let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 through 15. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. So as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. See, don't be spiritual children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. These are all things that are out there right now. All kinds of philosophies and views and what have you. They're just trying to trick you into turning away from God. Okay. That's what the smoke did. Okay. Smoke. And then what happened? From the smoke, out of the smoke, came locusts. Okay. Out of the smoke came locusts. So what are locusts? 
uh, you know, in the 10 plagues in Egypt before the Exodus, one of the plagues was the plague of locusts, right? And what did the locusts do? The locusts came and ate up all the produce, all green stuff, you know, all the fruits, all the grains, so that there was no more food left in all of Egypt. And it brought about a famine, right? But the strange thing about the locusts here in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, is this. Look what it says in verse 4. They were told, they are the locusts, they were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. What kind of locusts don't hurt the grass or the green thing or the tree? That's the only thing that they eat. So this is the clue to t tell us that this is not regular locusts, but these are spiritual locusts. Okay? So, since physical locusts eat up all the fruits and the grains, what do spiritual locusts do? Spiritual locusts eat spiritual fruits. You know, like the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5.22. The fruits of repentance, fruits of righteousness, fruits of faith, fruits of the word, fruits of love, etc., etc. Locusts eat up all of those fruits that we have built up in our lifetime through a living, of, a living a life of faith, right? When locusts come in, they eat it all up. It's all gone, okay? And where did the locusts come from? Came from the smoke, right? That's pride. So out of pride comes locusts, and it's going to eat up all of our spiritual fruits that we have built up until today. And we're going to have none left, okay? So let's look at Joel chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Joel chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Here we go. So they here are locusts, okay? If you read the entire chapter, it's talking about locusts, right? They rush on the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. Before them, the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. See, this is exactly how Revelation describes it, right? Before the locusts come, what happened? Earthquakes. And then the sun and the moon grow dark, right? Because of the smoke. And then the locusts come in through your windows like a thief. They don't come through the door. Come through your windows. Okay? Like a thief, right? That window gets opened by the smoke. Okay? So we need to be vigilant in guarding against these things. So these locusts could only harm those who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. In other words, what do these locusts eat? They eat away at our faith. They eat away at our faith in God. But those of us who have the seal of God will be protected. That's why we need to receive the seal of God. And then the locusts, what are they? What power are they given? They were given the power to torment like scorpions, but they cannot kill. They only torment for five months. They can't kill. Okay? That's what God said. So when you hear this, immediately what comes to mind is Job, right? Job. Remember in, in the Old Testament, Job? Satan wanted to test Job. So God said, okay. You could test him, but don't kill him. He said it twice like this, right? And what, what happened to Job, though? He was tested, but he passed the test. He did not curse God. He did not fall away from God. So Job's test is like the scorpion. It's like the torment of scorpion from the locusts, okay? So let's look at Job chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes, all the, uh, that a man has, he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face. And so in verse six, God says, so the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, power, only spare his life. See, God gave Satan the permission to do this. So in the end, God enables the star to open the bottomless pit. He lets the smoke come up. He lets the locusts come out. He lets them hurt, torment the people, but he does not let them kill. 
And why does he do this? Two things, okay? If you are chosen like Job, you will endure through this. Your, your faith will get stronger, but you will keep your faith until the end and you will pass. But if you're not, what will happen? Let's look at Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. So these people went through this, these plagues, right? These torment. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. The second thing will happen is these really hardened people, they will be tormented by these plagues and yet they will still not repent. And eventually they will be judged. Okay, so these two things will happen. So we're going to be receiving these kinds of things too. But if we are chosen by God, if we have the seal of God, we will be like Job. We will not turn away from God, but we will be able to keep the faith until the end. Okay, so that's why we need to be prepared. Okay, so let's look at the appearance, appearance of these locusts. What do they look like? So this is in Revelation chapter 9, verses 5 and the following. So verse 5 says, and they were not permitted to kill anyone, right? But to torment for five months. Let, let's look at verse 7. Look at verse 7 here. The appearance of the locusts, and there's a lot here, is like horses prepared for battle. On their heads appear to be crowns like gold. Their faces were like faces of men. They had hair like the hair of women. Their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of the wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tail is a power to hurt men for five months. So what do all these things mean? These things that are in Revelation chapter 9, verses 7 through 10. Let's look at them one by one, okay? They look like horses prepared for battle. So horses are animals used for warfare, right? So that means they're belligerent. They like to fight. That's one of their things is they're always fighting wars, making wars. And also horses symbolize speed. They're quick in their actions, quick to kill, quick to make fights and wars. Number two, they had crowns of gold, right? Crowns like gold. So this symbolizes a temporary victory. They will win temporarily. Crown is given to those who are victorious, right? To those who conquer. So they will conquer and they will win temporarily. Okay? So they have conquered the world right now. So they're wearing this crown of gold. But it's not forever. There will come a time when Christ returns and he will take over. And he will judge them. Okay? But this is temporary. And then number three, they had faces of men, right? Men, you know, people, human beings, faces of human beings symbolize wisdom. So they were wise. They're not stupid. That's why we have to be careful. They're very wise. And also they are humane in appearance. I don't even know if this makes sense, but let me explain. They look and talk in a very humanistic and humane way. Okay. That's why it's so easy to fall and to be deceived because they sound like they're good, they're humane, okay? And they seem to be just in their actions, in their dealings, in their speech. That's why it's so easy to be deceived. So we sh must not fall for that, okay? Number four, they had hair like women. So this is, the hair of women is their beauty, right? So in that sense, it means that they're very alluring and enticing. Okay, the temptation that they bring, it's very alluring. For example, 
you know, their philosophy may be very logical and their logic will be very tight. And in that sense, it will be very alluring. Whereas it may seem like the word of God is not so. Okay. That's why we have to be wise about this. And then number five, they had the teeth of lions. This symbolizes their ruthlessness in devouring human souls. It's devouring human souls. Okay, let's go to First Peter chapter five, verse eight. First Peter chapter where's First Peter chapter five, verse eight. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. See? So they had teeth like lions, even though they look very good and humane and just and very alluring and tempting. Outwardly, when you get close to them, their teeth come out and it's like a lion's teeth. They're ready to devour you. Okay? Number six. They had breastplates of iron. This symbolizes their powerful ability to conquer. So, like I said before, their worldview is very powerful and logical. And it reigns tightly over the enslaved souls who believe in it. Okay. These breastplates of iron uh, remind us of like what the Roman soldiers would have worn, right? They're very powerful and they ruled over the world. They had an empire, right? And number seven, it says that their power is in their tails. Their tails. What does that mean? Let's turn to Isaiah chapter nine, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15. So the head is the elder, an honorable man, and the prophet who teaches falsehood is the tail. What's the tail in the Bible? The tail is the false prophet. The prophet who teaches falsehood is the tail. So the power of these locusts, these beings, whatever they are, they're their power is in their tail, which are their false prophets. Satan uses his false prophets to sting us and to hurt us, to take us away from God. Okay. So who are these false prophets, right? Satan has their, his own false prophets. Now, when I say this, this may be a little bit controversial. I was thinking of some specific examples of false prophets that the locust, the, the devil that Satan used in modern times. I hope you don't like any of these guys. Or you could like them, but I'm not saying that you know, there's nothing that we can't learn from them, but you have to understand that this, this is an example of the false prophets that the devil uses in this day and age. For example... A guy like Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx. Some people have called these guys the false prophets of the modern age. These guys, basically, their philosophy, their whatever, their writings, have basically formed the modern era. You may not even know them, but they have influenced your life greatly. I mean, more than you would know. But a lot of their teaching is very dangerous. So, what I'm trying to say is this. All of these things that I've just talked about is going on right now. Has been going on since the 18th, 19th, 20th century and still ongoing. And their effects and their influence is great upon our lives right now. 
So we're living through this in our lifetime. Okay? Therefore, we must be sealed with God's word on our foreheads. If not, we will fall for these things. We have. We've been living in these kinds of things right now. Only by hearing God's word and believing in Jesus, we have been awakened to realize what this is. So we need to be very aware. The world, everything around us right now is controlled by Satan, who is the ruler of this world right now. So I hope and pray that, you know, I've said a lot of things and a lot of information here today. You may not get all this, but just know that these things are happening right now. We're living and breathing these things today. Okay, so we need to be vigilant and awake in prayer and, and in the word of God. Okay, so we'll just end here today and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your guidance and for your love, for helping us to awaken and to be able to see through your word how darkened and corrupt the world that we're living in truly is. May we be able to understand everything that you have taught us today so that we could truly receive the seal of God on our foreheads and that we may be able to keep our faith even through this era of the beast. May we plainly and clearly see and expose the works of the devil that is around us so that we, along with our family members and all the members of Evergreen Church, may receive God's seal and may be immune to the attacks of the, the tails of the scorpion and the locust and the smoke from the bottomless pit. Please protect us and be with us. Seal our hearts and our minds with your word so that we could withstand the temptations that are around us and be able to stand on Mount Zion with our faith intact. We thank you so much for everything and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Let's give God the glory with our applause.